Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and I am Science Fellow and Principal Atmospheric Scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. When you think about the background that uh, I have that got me to this point, I, I hope you find it kind of interesting here. So I was in high school. Um, I was not a very good high school student. I was probably top 70%, if that gives you an idea. But as I was coming out of high school and had to choose a major, um, what I really enjoyed doing, even though I was terrible at it, was doing problem solving. I liked the idea of being really good at mathematics and physics and chemistry and using those those tool sets and that those ideas and that knowledge to kind of solve problems and problems that folks had. And I found that atmospheric sciences often used a blend of those things to kind of understand the future behavior of the atmosphere. Now it's kind of funny, my title, science fellow and principal atmospheric scientist, if you would have told me that when I was a young kid that I'd be doing something like this in the future, I would have laughed at you. I never thought that I would have this particular career path. Fast forward, here I am in my early 40s. I spent 15 years on faculty at the University of Illinois where I taught thousands of students every single year. I now work as an operational meteorologist produ producing forecasts for, well, tens of thousands of people every single day in the ag community. And I'm very much in the front. I'm not in the back. And in fact, my career is very forward facing. I get a lot of opportunity to talk a lot about you. Uh, I started a couple of small companies along the way. We did seasonal weather prediction for reinsurance first. I then uh, met some great guys that had formed a company called Ag Informatics. We merged the companies together that we had started and became Agrable. And we started to grow Agrable. And in 2018, Nutrien came in and saw some of the tools we had built and said, you know, this would be a great way to kind of introduce what we're doing here on this ag tech side of things to our customer growers where we can combine the cool stuff going on in tech with our experience, which is vital to produce a really awesome product. And I bought into it and Nutrien bought us and said, hey, you want to come work for us full time? And I said, you know what? Let's, uh, let's try something new here. And that's how I got to this position as science fellow and principal atmospheric scientist here at Nutrien Ag Solutions. And to be honest, it has been a fantastic journey and I love working for Nutrien. It's been a great company to, to represent and they've allowed me a lot of freedoms to uh, go out and do some great research and get to explain what I know about weather and its impact on production agriculture down to the field level to the growers I get to interact with. Now, when you think about what it takes to be an atmospheric scientist, we often think about just the vast quantities of data that are collected. In fact, I'm sitting here in my office. This is where kind of all the magic happens here. I'm actually in a spare bedroom. That's a Murphy bed behind me. You see, I've, I've decorated a little bit here. Uh, but here I am in this room, and, and next to me, I have four, one, two, three, four servers. And probably if I added all of this up, I've got around 40 or 50 terabytes of disk space and it's all completely full of, of data. We process a lot of data to analyze historical weather. And then I access from some of the world's largest computing facilities like Amazon and Google, and of course what we have at the National Center for Environmental Prediction and the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. I access all of that weather data constantly. The stream of data through me to you is, is very wide. In fact, we should call it a, a massive river of data because we have to process that to understand what it's gonna to do to basically distill down into a forecast, to explain to folks how we think weather's gonna change. This is a fresh and new science, and we're making major strides forward in understanding how, well, how weather works, and the way it works, and how it impacts what you do. But there are limits to predictability, how far out we can see accurately. And my job in Nutrien is to expand those limits. Without all the data that I have access to, I could never do it. You know, across the United States, when we look at the extensive history that we have of weather data, there are some places, thanks to the U.S. military, where we have very reliable records that go back to the late 1890s. And over that time period, we've been able to assess and pool all of that data and look at the trends. And that's one of my favorite things to do, is to understand what are the longer term trends across the United States, across Canada, and across the world. Now. Other places around the world don't have such a rich history of data. In fact, there are many places where we still don't even observe the weather at the surface. We may use some nearby radar or use some satellite observations, but that's not what we want. We'd like to have weather sensors everywhere we possibly can so that we can collect the highest resolution data both in space and in time. But that's one of the things that's changing in atmospheric sciences. As we do build more of these sensors, make better satellite technology and spread our radar network around the world, we're gonna get better and better at collecting data, which 
is going to improve prediction but also give us a rich history of data that we can use to help understand the past because learning from the past is the most important thing we do right away when we train new atmospheric scientists so they can understand those patterns and how they apply to the future. So this is a very data rich community but it's growing constantly and the historical databases we're building will be vital to the future prediction of the state of the atmosphere. Now, one of the most common questions I get is how accurate are we at forecasting? And I want everyone to listen very carefully here, okay? When you think about the accuracy of a forecast, it means different things to different people. Now, for a specific location, like if I'm gonna forecast for your back 40, just as an example, one of the more challenging things to do here is to be accurate beyond just a few days. In fact, when it's summer, trying to predict the behavior of thunderstorms, we can't even do that six to 12 hours in advance. We can find where the ingredients are coming together to make storms, but once they form, we now cast them. They take on their own shape and form and feed off their own local environment and move accordingly. Therefore, to predict exactly what one of those things is gonna do is very challenging. But when it comes to other variables, like maybe forecasting your humidity or the pressure or the temperature in the wind, those kind of things we're pretty accurate at. In fact, we can be within a few degrees of a temperature forecast, maybe out six, seven, or eight days. But there are limits to predictability. I'm going to share those with you, okay? Some research done by a famous scientist named Edward Lorenz. He was studying chaos theory way back in the 1950s. He basically studied what he thought would be the limit of weather prediction, a cool little side bit of his research. And this is what he came up with. He discovered in the 1950s that even with perfect technology and a vast array of sensors collecting weather data, that the limits of predictability to be within an acceptable error in forecasting your weather, going out anything beyond about 21 days, he thought would be impossible. We've repeated that research every decade since then, and we have not changed his conclusions. So I know that you'll go out there and you'll find weather services that may say they give you a day-by-day -day forecast or even not the next 11 months. I'm here to tell you that's impossible to do. Now we have climatology. So if you said, Eric, what's the forecast on the 4th of July next year? I'd say, well, if you're in Champaign, Illinois, which is where I'm from, uh, you know what? High of 85, low of 68, 30% chance of storms. And most of the time I'd be pretty darn close because that's climatology. That would be the average. But in reality, listen to carefully here. When you get out to about a 10 day forecast, the statistical accuracy and skill of those forecasts is about 65%. And that's why at Nutrien, my research program is to expand that. If I could get that to 70%, I will have made a massive contribution to the field of atmospheric sciences. And I will work tirelessly to do that until I retire. But that's the reality of it. So when we think about what the longer term trends are in, in, in Earth's climate, we have a very rich history of data on which we can build those trends. And if you think, I'm, I think I'll just talk specifically today to, to those folks in the Corn Belt. Let me just tell you what I've observed. And when you look back over the last 70 years, the primary corn and soybean belt over that time period has increased total growing season precipitation, that's April, October, by about five and a half inches of rainfall. Now understand something, there's a lot of variability. We still have in that data sets years like 1988 and 2012. But overall, the trend is upward, but variability is increasing quite a bit. In my home state of Illinois, I can tell you some numbers about it. While we have seen an increase of total precipitation by about five and a half to six inches throughout the growing season, what's also changed is the frequency of heavy rainfall events. We've increased those in some places by as much as a doubling since the 1980s. So what that means is we're getting more of our rainfall in big helpings followed by longer stretches of drier weather. In Illinois, we've increased our overnight low temperatures about three degrees. That's bought us an extra about nine days of our frost-free season. But our maximum temperatures in this part of the world have relatively stayed flat. But if we think about those longer term trends and how they impact things, that increase in the growing season and the warmer overnight lows have also kind of juiced up the atmosphere a little bit. And what, am I, what I mean there is that we've increased our total precipitable water right here, about 15%. And our relative humidity has gone up about 6% over that time period. In other words, we're getting wetter in this part of the world. Now, that's not true around the rest of the world. But what we do at Nutrient is we study these things at all of those growing areas around the world to try to assess how those changes might impact business. 
Now, if you think about what that would mean for an Illinois farmer on ROI, I want to sh share with you a tweet that I read back in March of 2020. Guy, a young farmer in Illinois named Mark, and Mark puts out there a question. He says, "What's my highest? Uh, what's my best investment for the highest ROI on my fields here in uh, in Illinois?" The most common answer was to put down pattern tile. And the reason, well, I told you, we're seeing an increase in level and precipitation and variability. Doesn't mean we won't see drought in this area, but it means that overall, we're getting wetter with time. And those are some of the trends that we analyze and try to study. Because ultimately at Nutrain, what we're focused on is your ROI, the grower. We want to be a partner in your success moving forward. So they hire guys like me to study how the weather might be changing in the background that affects your business. So when it comes to the tools that we want to get in the hands of growers, so that's it. you can be looking at weather analysis and forecasting information and then execute a decision based upon it, well, the quickest and easiest way to get access to a, the vast amount of data that I have access to and the forecasting resources that I use is to get signed up for our daily newsletter. We send it out every morning and I produce it. I hand make it every single morning. And in that newsletter, I, I, I provide all of the links that I have to all of the weather information that I produce. We want to get it all into your hands so you can see it and analyze it along with me to help make those decisions. Now, how do you get access to it? Okay, put into the web browser info.nutrien dot com forward slash snodgrass underscore weather info.nutrient.com forward slash snodgrass underscore weather get in there put your email in hit submit and you'll get subscribed to my daily newsletter and when you get that particular morning uh, newsletter which tries i try to get that out there right before the markets open so you can kind of see maybe what the weather might do to influence the markets You'll not only have access to a vast array of national and international weather information, because I'll cover other places around the world, South America, Australia, China, India, as well as Europe and Russia. And you'll have a lot of great detailed information about both the near term and the long term forecast here for the United States and Canada as well. But in that, you'll start to be able to find all the links and resources I use so that you can use them as well and watch the weather with me so we can both make decisions together on how things are going to change and ultimately impact your operations. You know, the things that I'm most excited about in atmospheric sciences are the expansions we're seeing in technology. What I mean by that is faster computing, cheaper and better sensors, and more of them. You see, what really holds us back in our limits of weather forecasting, really the limits of it, have to do with computing and observations. Essentially, the more observations we have of the weather around the world, across the oceans, especially right here in our own backyards, the better we are going to be able to forecast the future weather because more input is then going into those you know, extremely valuable weather forecast models. Plus, it gives us more data to compare the forecast against, thus improving statistically the performance of those models. Now, computing technology needs to make major leaps and bounds to keep up with what we want to do. And I know that's kind of sounds funny to say, given where we currently are with computing technology. I mean, just this morning, I bought a terabyte of disk space that's going to come to me in a little stick about that big. Yet when you think about where we're going into the future with computing, well, most atmospheric scientists would tell you right now, we need to have our weather forecast models running on computers that are three orders of magnitude faster than what they are right now. That's a thousand times faster. We'll get there. We'll be using that technology very, very soon. So I'm most excited about that in terms of technological development, but there's another aspect to it as well. I'm excited about the development happening in our younger students. You see, our younger students are gaining greater and greater experience, both in the workforce and through their education, on how all of the systems that come together to impact agriculture are doing just that. And weather is a big component of that. And I love getting the chance to educate the newest group of students that want to study atmospheric sciences. So there's that investment in technology that I want to be a part of as well. Those are the things that keep me excited, keep me going day after day. And as all that new tech rolls out, what I'm attempting to do is to marry it with extensive experience. Because as I've said, together, that is the best product we have to offer here as a service in atmospheric sciences, weather prediction, and in agriculture. And I'm gonna work hard to make that happen.
You know, there's a question that I get asked quite a bit, and I, I want to address it here with you all because I think it's important. It's the, the question really revolves around, what do I wish people knew about what, what I do? Well, let me just give you a quick rundown here. I travel the country a lot for work. I speak generally about 100 to 150 different events a year where I get a chance to interact with growers. That puts me on the road a lot. That means I have a lot of very early mornings and very late nights, like many of you do as well. I spend a lot of time on an airplane. I spend a lot of time behind the seat of a truck. In fact, just in the last four weeks here, I put 5,000 miles on my work truck. Now, the reason why I say that is because I want folks to know that if you contact me, email me, call me, text me, whatever, there's a chance I don't get back to you right away. And that doesn't mean that I'm not interested. It just means that sometimes when I get home and I miss a few hundred emails, it takes me a while just to clean all that up and to get a response back to folks. I absolutely love the communication because without it, I wouldn't really have good reason to do what I do if I didn't know how it was affecting what you do. The second thing is, is my job does require me to kind of work some strange hours. There are mornings where I wake up quite early and nights where I stay quite late. A lot of us experience this, but I did make an adjustment uh, earlier here in the year 2021. I used to wake up for the last seven years almost every day at 2 a.m., but that was burning me out. That was tough to work uh, that early in the morning and then stay up in the evening with my family doing things and coaching soccer and playing basketball with my buddies and doing stuff like that and just spending time with my kids and my wife. So I made an adjustment and I switched things up to where now I get up every day about 4.45, which is way easier. But I just want you all to know that I'm up early working just as you are and I want you to know that uh, we're pushing hard to give you the best information we can. I think the last thing I want you to know is this. I, I, I want you to know that predicting the future behavior of the atmosphere is challenging and I'm gonna be wrong, especially as my research program pushes the limits of prediction, trying to give you better and more accurate forecasts, not only in the next 10 to 15 days, for the next month or two months or six months or the whole next year. I'm gonna work hard to do that, but you have to allow me to be wrong at times because when we're wrong, we learn from those mistakes and I'll get better and better and better. So stick with me. Don't dump it the, media, the first time that maybe we get a long range forecast incorrect because that is most certainly gonna happen. If you wanna think about it this way, maybe I, I would, I would put, put it into this phrase. When you think about the challenges of forecasting the weather, it's like trying to predict the future behavior of a nonlinear chaotic system, a nonlinear chaotic fluid, that's the atmosphere. And every day you wake up and there's a new problem because it's made an adjustment, it's shifted, it's doing something new. We have to try to follow it and key in on what are the main factors that guided it in the direction that it's currently going and say, is it gonna continue to do that or is something else gonna influence it? Because one of the things I want you to know about the weather is that it's connected. Stuff that happens half a world away can impact the weather right here on your local farm or your local operation or where you're sitting as you watch this video of me today. Don't forget that, all right? So I love what I do, but I would ask a little bit of maybe forgiveness as we start to get some of those forecasts out there longer and longer. We're gonna make mistakes and I want you to keep a close eye on it. Let me know when we do that, keep in contact, but just remember predicting this is pretty tough business.